Hello, Yes But Why listeners. This is your host, Amy Jordan. Welcome to episode 211, a conversation with actor, writer, director, Tracy B. Wilson. But first, a bit about our sponsor. This episode of Yes But Why podcast is sponsored by Audible. You can get your free audiobook download and your 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. In my chat with Tracy B. Wilson, she shares some really great advice for the kind of homework you have to do before an audition. When I put auditioning in the search bar on Audible, I get tons of titles offering up advice for you and your acting career. Oh, and uh, <laughs> one that looks like an erotic novel, but uh, hey, maybe you're into that. I don't know. Audible is available for your iPhone, Android, or Kindle. Download your free audiobook today at audibletrial.com forward slash yes but why. In this episode of Yes But Why, listen in as I get to know performer Tracy B. Wilson. We chat about Tracy's career in physical comedy from party mime to sports mascot to curious George on tour. Tracy talks about the life-changing experience that was doing photography on tour with Lady Gaga for both the Monster Ball and the Born This Way Ball tours. Tracy has been making sketch comedy at home while alone in New York City. Check out her newest quarantine characters at TracyBWilson.com. I now present to you Yes But Why, Episode 211. Tracy B. Wilson does lots of fun and creative stuff. I'm Amy Jordan, and this is Yes But Why Podcast. Yeah. My dad is retired now, but he taught elementary school art. And because he was an elementary school art teacher, you know, it's not the most lucrative job in the world uh, financially, but in his heart, the best job ever. Um, but so he did a lot of things, side job, trucks for money. And one of them was to do the sets for the middle school play, for the middle school shows. Nice. And also he did the sets for the shows that he did in elementary school for art, for the middle school shows and the other school shows and so because we didn't have a lot of extra money for babysitters and all that I would with my two sisters I'm the middle of three we would go to the theater um like the middle school theater and we would just like sit while my dad built sets or he'd give us paint brushes or you know give us like little tasks that we could do and so it legitimately the theater to me was a playground and I couldn't wait to be nine because you had to be nine to be old enough to be in the elementary school musical. <laughs> so to be in the operetta. No, this is a true story. And like I would go to with my dad and I would sit in every seat and count every seat. He would let us, we would like go into the catwalks of the theater and like walk around like way up high. We would like, I would, in the evenings, we would just go and play. And, and I grew up very creatively. My mom also, um, she is like a, a artist, though she would not call herself that professionally. She does a lot of artwork and she was a teacher's aide, and, but she's very, very creative and a great fine artist. And the way we grew up, we were not allowed, ready for this, we were not, we were not allowed to have coloring books or paint by numbers because those are non-creative because it's a picture oh. that you color inside, right? Oh, we were allowed as much construction paper and paints and markers and colored pencils that we could have, but nothing that was already made, nothing that came out of a kit, nothing that, I mean, I did a lot of stand up about this for a while that like, you know, the most rebellious thing I ever did when I was a kid is my sister got a paint by number um, and like fifth grade at a birthday party. She came home from a birthday party with a paint by number and we literally, this is a true story. We hid the paint by number and did it secretly in the basement where my dad wouldn't see it. <laughs> it's so funny it how our like, parents get in our brains oh, like that. Right? And so it oh was God, like, so you funny. do the twos, I'll do the fours, you do odds, I'll do evens. And we literally hid this. We put it on an easel. The most rebellious thing I ever did as a kid was put a paint by number on an easel. <laughs> 
<laughs> because, you know, with my dad, we would get in trouble for doing a paint by number. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, but my parents also, we didn't watch cartoons on Saturday. We didn't watch a lot of TV, but they would say, and literally this is, and you wonder why I did so much improv. It was, my parents <laughs> would say, you love this. They'd say, here's a stick, go outside and make up a game. Like <laughs> that is how I grew up. And so I don't, I just That's don't, what they're doing now. I don't, yeah, that's what I'm reading back to, you know? But that was how it was. And so what's funny is, so listen, in New York, I did a lot of improv and a lot of sketch and all the things. There is a certain part of me that never fit into that world all the way because I'm not a kid that was raised on TV or that watched a lot of cartoons. Like, I have no pop culture references oh, to The Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. You know, that's, that's, that part of my brain is not, it doesn't gel with everybody else. Because I'm like, I don't know, I was in the backyard pretending I was in a tornado when it was windy. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know what, though? There's a lot to that. You know, there's been big discussions about, you know, using pop culture references and like, you know, how that can exclude certain people and whatnot. Like, or my favorite is like, who cares if you don't know what it is? Just turn it into something different. And then the whole audience oh, sure. might know it as A, but then you're like dealing with it as B and they think it's the funniest thing in the whole wide world. But I get you that like, you know, you're almost like your level of creativity is like I've been improving for <laughs> since I was five. My Never whole mind. Life. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. I just like, learned how to yes and. Oh no no. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I've been, like yes anding was like. I mean, it was taught to us without those words, yeah. right? Like I think it was articulated as I actually like studied improv and all that stuff. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been doing this stuff a long time. I learned the games. I learned this stuff. But I even, even only recently, the um, the phrase like to gamify things, like to make kids learn or to like, you know, everything becomes a game and then it's fun. Like my dad, when we were growing up, we, um, we lived in a small house and we added an addition. We added like a family room onto the house. But my dad and my mom and my sisters and I did most of the work. And I was 11, like laying floorboards, right? Mm -hmm. right? And... But it was like a game, like 25 nails and a hammer and like see who could like get to the end of the row first, but safely, of course. Even like our chores were that way. It's like we would play this game at the end of the night. Now, I will also say my sisters and my memories are different <laughs> because I think you, you internalize things differently in your own life where you are or how you receive information or whatever. But to me, everything was a game. And at the end of the day, we would play the five things game. Before you go to bed, put away five things. Walk through each room, put away five things. That's it, five. And then you do five and you might maybe do ten. But, like, everything was a game. Go do five things. You're like, okay, I can do five things. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's funny. I like We it. just grew up. I just grew up in a very, very creative home. And oh, like nice. all my sisters are known for it. Like my whole family is just like, oh, it's the Wilsons. Like, oh, the Wilsons can make something up. How the Wilsons do it? Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. So, were you guys the ones with the uh, big Christmas decorations every year and the Halloween haunted house through your living room or anything like that? It's funny when I think back. My parents made like. I guess it's called, a, you know, it's like environmental theater, right? Like a, my, my parents helped make this thing like, like at our church when we were growing up, where it was this thing called the journey to Bethlehem. And my mom was the director and writer and my dad was, did all the stuff. And it was like the Mary and Joseph and they go through the town and they, you know, there's no room in the inn and they go to the stable, but like you walked through it. Like you walked through the church and you, and they like redid the whole church into this huge like, it wasn't, like, a pageant that you watch. It was, like, this experience. And it wasn't even <laughs> – and it was, like, less – this is a terrible thing to say about the thing called the Journey to Bethlehem. It was religious, but it was more about, like, this communal experience. You know what I mean? Like, we grew up Presbyterian. It was, like – the tenets of that is, like, just be good to your neighbor. You know what I mean? Like – whatever you want to do, just be good to your neighbor. Just be good to your neighbor. You but know, this was your parents, like, immersive theater piece that they yes, uh, were able to do like, as adults? 
Yeah, you know. And it went, and we did it for years. But what's funny is, so that thing we did when I was a kid, I didn't realize until I was like a full grown adult that I was like, oh yeah, my mom directed this immersive theater piece. Yeah. You know, and like my, I knew my dad did the staff and I knew, but I was like, I. I think the older that you get, the more you realize these influences, both negative and positive, that like how you were shaped and like what you want to carry and what you don't of how you were raised, you know? Yeah. And like little details about your parents that you like find out about them as an adult that you can like understand as an adult now. You know what I mean? As opposed to when you were a kid, you're like, I heard the story that this happened, but now only as an adult do I like grasp it or... Uh, uh-huh. You know, like connected to myself as a like, oh, I do that kind of stuff, too. You know, like well, you were talking earlier about how your your parents were against uh, coloring books and stuff like that. My mom, uh, also involved in teaching, uh, was in the teachers uh, union, deeply uh, mm-hmm. obsessed with unions and wouldn't let us eat grapes as kids because the grape pickers were not unionized. And that was something that she was standing up against. And so we didn't have grapes until we were adults and I like remember getting a phone call from my sister I was in college and she called me and she was like hey guess what I got I got some grapes <laughs> and I was like you did what are they in the house and she's like no I'm not in the house okay she's like no I have them in my car but I bought them at the store and I was like don't let mom see you while you're eating your mom that. Was- I, it's so funny. Yeah. You know what's funny about it is like I talk to her now and I'm like, we were so yeah. wor- worried about eating grapes. And she's like, oh, it wasn't that big a deal. I was like, what? It was a big deal. But that's so funny, though, because to you, right, you latched onto that thing at a certain point in time when you're a kid and mm-hmm. you understand what this means. And mm-hmm. then, yeah, it's funny, like what becomes a thing and not. So my dad um, was the treasurer of the teacher. And when I was a kid, there was a teacher's freeze, and my dad went to jail for 10 days because he was a striking teacher in a teacher's union. Oh. And yeah, yeah. And so not, not where you thought this interview was going to go, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's very, that's like my whole course, life. You know? Now my whole life right? was in unions. I held picket signs before I did anything else. Yes. Like, yeah. yes. Well, I mean, that, I mean, that was an important thing, uh, as an actor, when I moved to New York, like the excitement of being a part of this professional guild and saying, like, I'm a union actor. And like, here I am. And it was a big, important deal to join the union. I know. You know? I know. I'm still not in the union. I'm, I'm still thinking about it. You know what I mean? Oh, uh, so, right? yeah. Whatever it means. Yeah. And sometimes it means yeah. stuff and I, sometimes it doesn't. So, you know, I know. but, it, I but think to right me. Now, I think it is complicated. Yeah. But. In the long term, it it does mean, you know, fair wages and protection and all those great things. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. um, Oh, I'm a union gal. Believe me. I'm uh, Yeah. Well, clearly you didn't eat grapes. Well, I didn't eat grapes. I remember the first time I ate them. I ate them today. Um, But every time I eat them, I feel like I'm doing something wrong, which I like. It's good. I'm going to think about you when I eat grapes. Yeah. But if you like, like, it's such a, like, healthy thing to feel guilty about eating. You know what I mean? It's not chocolate yeah. or, like, cookies or whatever. But I'm like, <laughs> every time I have it, I'm like, <laughs> like. That, that is amazing. I that is so rebellious you in the great. <laughs> and I'm just hoping the workers are unionized now. I was like, Mom, are they okay? I've By the way, I've been eating yeah. grapes since I left home. But it's like admitting <laughs> doing drugs. Mom, I'm a grape addict. That's amazing. Oh, so funny. So tell me, you mentioned a couple times that um, you have done a sketch and improv in New York City. Yeah. Now, where did mm-hmm. you start? You didn't grow up in New York City. No, I grew up in Orchard Park, New York, which is a suburb of Buffalo, South Towns, Buffalo. Right. Uh, South Towns to Western New Yorkers means the snow belt. That means <laughs> from school. Um, uh, and then... Uh, I did theater growing up. I, cause you know, when I was nine, like I said, I got to be nine and I got to be in James and the giant peach where I played Miss spider. That was very exciting. Yeah. I had a cool costume. It was very cool. And then I did theater and I wasn't really like a good singer. And 
it, it wasn't, you wouldn't look at me and go, oh, she has it. I wasn't that kid. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wasn't like, oh, we couldn't afford dance lessons. I wasn't, you know, but I freaking loved it. Um, but I was really good at the theater stuff and the comedy stuff. And so, like, I played Helen Keller when I was in 10th grade, and that was a big deal. And, you know, I got a, I got some, like, I got my first fan letter from somebody's oh. mom wrote me a letter through the school. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, was, I was president of the drama club and all that kind of stuff. And then I went to college uh, to a small state school, and I really wanted to go to a fancy theater school. Right. I wanted to go to NYU or Carnegie Mellon. I had a friend that went to Carnegie Mellon and I worshipped him and he was a couple years older than me. He was my sister's friend and he would come home over the summers and I'd be like, what books should I read? You know, and, um, and so I went to a small state school that was not where I wanted to be. And it was a great school for things. Great school for teachers, great school for physical education and a lot of stuff, but it wasn't a theater school. And he would, I would say to other students, they'd be like, oh, what's your major? And I'd say theater. And they'd go, uh, we have. That would be the first question is we have that. And then the second question would be, well, what are you going to do when you leave school? <laughs> and I'm like, be an actor, you asshole. <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> Man, because people always ask like, that. Were... That's like the number one thing. They're like, what are you going to do with that? I mean, you know, because people think it's like not a job and then you spend all day watching Netflix. So, well, yeah, clearly the, plus you know, like jobs. the just I mean, now if I've learned anything getting older, it's like I don't think it really matters at all what you have a major in in your bachelor's degree. Like it really just does not affect anything no, in your matter. life. I've never not gotten a job. They weren't like you're a drama major. I'm sorry. We can't have those here. Like that's not a thing. Yeah. So <laughs> it's like you're yeah, fine. And well, I oh, actually right. did not. I did not stay at school. Right. Um, I, uh, was paying for school mostly on my own and also side note, super boring, but I got Lyme disease and I was super sick for a very long time Oof. and I kept having like to quit through school college. And yeah. 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 And so like I go to school for a semester, then I get sick and I have to leave and then I go mm -hmm. back again. I get sick again and have to leave before they figured out like kind of what was the matter with me and all this. It was mm -hmm. a long, boring, you know, but, yeah. um, it also put me behind in school in a school that I really didn't want to be at anyway. Mm. And so when I was driving, and I, listen, I did the best I could, and I was an RA, and I had leads in the shows, and I did fine, but I didn't love it, and I wasn't really learning anything. Sure. And because I had already been, like, teaching theater camp in high school and doing all those things, and I was like, I don't know, I felt like my first year of college, I was like, um, I've already taught this since the eight-year-old. You know yeah. what I mean? It wasn't, it just wasn't where I wanted to be. Yeah. And so... I was driving back to school. I had got my sister's hand-me-down car. And it was the beginning of what would be my junior year. But really, I was like, I only had two semesters worth of credit. And I came over this little hill, and I saw the college, and I just started to cry. And I was like, no. <laughs> like, and I'm coming. I told my parents. I said, uh, I'm, I'm leaving school. I'm done. I'm done. And my mom was super upset. And I will tell you, I think it's the first real adult decision that I ever made. It was the first decision that I made for myself, for my own, knowing, knowing what I wanted and what served me as a human. And I'm like, this is not it. Yeah. And so I said, I'm going to go back to Buffalo and I'm going to, there's a, there's actually for the size of the city, there's a thriving theater community in Buffalo. It's a fantastic theater community. Awesome. And there's lots of small professional theater and New York for a few years and come back and open theater companies and you know and um, there's a lot of great teachers that also do theater and that they have that are amazing teachers by day music teachers and stuff and then and do the theater scene and it's a really really supportive rich creative environment and so like I did theater in Buffalo for a couple of years and awesome. it was wonderful and I learned more from doing shows and acting opposite the people who are the theater professors that were doing, you know, like it was the best experience of just doing shows and learning from people that I was doing shows with. Yeah. Um, and then I made myself a deal that I would apply to Carnegie Mellon. And if I got in, then, you know, obviously I would go. And if I didn't, I would move to New York. And 
I like to tell the story that I got waitlisted, but I just plain didn't get it. <laughs> Appreciate um, the honesty. Appreciate I, the honesty. Yes, right. I, I like to pretend I got waitlisted, uh, but then I just said I'm going to move to New York and I'm just going to create my own studies. I'm going to find theater and I'm going to take dance classes for the first time in earnest, and I'm going to like find a voice teacher and I'm just going to push together my own. You know, I'm going to cobble it together. Um, yeah. It was the best best thing I ever did. Absolutely. What yeah. year was this when you moved to New York? So I moved to New York in 96, 7, 6, 7. And uh, <laughs> so I know. We've I landed know. on 1997. So, so, so long. <laughs> I'll, I'll land on 99. I'll land on, no. But before, you know, before oh. 2001, before 9 11. Yeah, like end of the 90s. Sure, um, sure. A good time. And a great, it was, I loved it. Yeah. But it was interesting, you know, kind of pre-explosion of everything online and you know you got backstage magazine once a week and Mm -hmm. I didn't even own a computer I would I would uh on Thursdays I would get backstage and then I would watch friends in ER while I cut out submissions and then Friday morning I would go to Kinko's where I rented a computer to type out my cover letter system out of system and then I I uh waitress and did kids birthday parties and took classes and it was amazing and I loved all of it and I knew that it was part of a bigger picture and I didn't expect like oh I'm going to be famous in five minutes Um, but I knew that like I was excited to be in New York learning and being a part of the theater scene and doing comedy and doing improv. And, and so to answer your improv questions, when I moved, there wasn't like the school system yet. Right. Right. It, it was just starting then. It wasn't a system and a pit wasn't a system. It was all just starting. Mm. And so I was in like a, just a ton of indie groups doing indie shows. And, um, was it like open mics time, and would... stuff at different theaters? Because when I first got there in 2000, it was mostly that, like that I noticed. I didn't, I also didn't know anything about improv until <laughs> I moved away. So, but... in, so I, when I was in this improv group, um, yeah, we did like a lot of shows at like cabaret spaces. Mm-hmm, yeah. So we did like cabaret nights, you know, so we would like do our own shows, but they would be more like it. Don't tell mama. You know, right. like stuff like that, like piano bars and in these tiny little stages. <laughs> like, but then I was in this group called Living Room Live, and this was fantastic. So Living Room Live, we performed in the downstairs of a bar on the Upper West Side, um, and there were it was like sat about fifty people. There was a big stage and like lots of like mismatched couches and chairs kind of thing, and this like downstairs bar. And we did shows every Tuesday night. And we had like, you know, between like 30 and 50 people, sometimes 70, sometimes 10. You know, we had like a little, we had like a little cult following every Tuesday night. And it was just like Saturday Night Live, except for instead of, in format is what I mean. (laughs) Then instead of a musical guest, we would have um, stand-ups come. And so each week Mm -hmm. you were responsible for writing a brand new sketch. And then you directed your sketch and you picked who you wanted to be in it. And then there was like 10 of us in the ensemble. So sometimes you might be in 10 sketches and sometimes you might be in two, but each week, you know, you made your own costumes and did your own props, memorize your lines. And we would, one day would be show. Then a couple days later we rehearse, then rehearse before the show, then do the show. And it was magical. It was a magical, magical time. Um, I loved it. I loved it so much. Yeah, That's like wonderful. every week, brand new shows. And, and what's interesting, though, is, you know, you're talking, like, prior to the Internet, you know? Mm-hmm. Not, okay, prior to YouTube. Prior to YouTube. So we weren't, this wasn't like, make videos for the Internet and, like, do stuff for, you know? And in some ways, it was, this, um, this is how old I am, right? It was so pure, right? <laughs> it was just like... Yes, we wanted to get people to come, and we were trying to get casting directors to come, and then we would do these, like, theater shows. Every couple of months, we'd do a theater show that would be the sort of best of of the last few months, you know, um, and we'd invite a bunch of casting directors and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was really, it was a super exciting time, and the sketches, like, were theater pieces, so you didn't, you know, there are some that we've recorded, but most of them we didn't, and... um and at that time also, I had been, and so I did, I did have some, 
fun successes right away. And I booked a ton of national commercials and I used to be, I used to do sketches on David Letterman, which was super fun. Um, and I worked on the soap operas a lot. <laughs> like I was like in this like crazy mixture of all of it, you know? It was, so when you amazing. got there, you like caught a wave, you got like national commercials, especially in the late nineties. That, that was great. Right. It was a big deal at the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah now it, they're like, eh, so, you know, yeah. I mean, I, so moved to New York, start taking classes, join a comedy group, um, an improv group. So I'm in this improv group. And then I book my first, okay, I booked a national tour playing Curious George uh, on a theater tour of Curious George. And I played the monkey. And wow. I wanted this super badly. And I had actually auditioned wow. for it when I still lived in Buffalo, but my doctor uh, wouldn't, this is when I was still kind of getting over being sick. And they said, no, it's too early for you to take a tour. You can't do it. So I was really super bummed. But it was for Theater Works USA, and the way Theater Works worked was you um, auditioned, so it was non-union, but auditions were either, because it was children's theater, and you got this, like, TYA contract that made you join Actors Equity, right? So a lot of people joined Actors Equity by doing children's theater tours, and I really wanted to play Curious George. I had done a ton of physical comedy already. I had this character. It was, like, a whole thing, so I was like, I'm totally going to book this. Yeah. Now, when you are, when you audition, though, you go to this open call where you audition for the 15 shows they're doing. And you go and you sing a song, and then they call you back for whatever shows they think that you're right for. Well, <sighs> Curious George doesn't sing, and I didn't want to be in any of the musicals because I'm not, I'm not a singer. And so I was like, no, I just want to do this physical comedy role. So I show up to this open call. I walk in, and they say, uh, great. Uh, what are you going to sing for us? And I say, oh, I'm not. <laughs> now, this is like one of those like long tables with all the people behind it. You know, it's like they've all got all the materials in front of them. And, and I was so like brazen, but in a good way, you know. And I just said, oh, I'm not. I'm here to play Curious George. And they were like, okay. And so I had made this like physical comedy piece where I brought a book of Curious George and I like did somersaults and like read the book with my feet and I like made up this whole thing. And awesome. you know, I booked it. it yeah, amazing. you did. It's super amazing. And so, okay. About the commercials. So prior to this, I had, I had been auditioning from commercials quite a bit and always getting called back and always getting called back, but never booking them. And, and it would always be like, Oh, went to the other girl, went to the other girl, never booked them. <laughs> so this is like six months. Comedy group, all these auditions, and then I leave for the tour. And I come back from the tour, but here's the thing. While I was on tour, and this is, again, like, I didn't even own a cell phone. This is, you know, end of the 90s. So I um, watch commercials in the hotel room as if my life depends on it. Instead of switching from show to show, I switch from commercial to commercial. And my goal was to learn how to do the what I called the tampon tone of voice, mm -hmm. right? So, because when I moved to New York, I'm like loud and big and did shows and all this crazy stuff. And I go to my first commercial audition and it was for some like bath and body wash something. And I am sitting in the lobby and I'm like, oh my God, I've seen all of these people on television already. Oh, whoa. I was so nervous. And I felt it was like tiny little young, tiny little thing from Buffalo, you know? And I go into the room and I had like read my how to act in commercials book, <laughs> you know, like I knew I, I had my script underlined and circled and highlighted and, you know, and yeah. so I go in and I was over the top gigantic, like terrible. <laughs> and so I had a good, I had a good commercial agent and the casting director who did not have to do this. And the more I've learned, the more I'm like, wow, this is remarkable what she did. She like stops the tape and she just like, you could see she's like almost laughing. She puts her hands up to her mouth and she goes, um, okay, so, so you just moved here and you do a lot of theater. <laughs> and I said, um, yeah. And she said, listen, I know you've, you've come from a good place. You have, they obviously trust you and what you do. I said, I'm going to show you what you just did. I was like, okay. So she shows me the tape. She plays it back, and it was mortifying. I mean, I was like, like acting like I was on top of the Empire State Building. I don't know what I was doing. I was, 
I mean, I was over the, I was crazy pants. And yeah. so she was like, she's like, you're, you're funny. You're cute. You're smart. Whatever. Just do the thing. Just do the thing. But like, I couldn't get it. So all these commercials, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. I'm getting close. But I just still haven't quite cracked the code. So I'm on tour with Curious George and I'm watching commercials over and over. <laughs> and as they would talk, I would like repeat back what they said, said it until I felt in my voice, what is that tone of voice? And so I felt it in my throat, in my body, how are they talking? Because they're not projecting, you know? And I hadn't done film and television before. Not really. I'd done some, like, local commercials, but no dialogue and, you know, whatever. And I hadn't cracked the code of, like, talking naturally on film and television. Mm. And so I come back. I feel like I've learned the tampon tone of voice. I call my agent. I say I'm back from tour. They send me on a tampon commercial audition. <laughs> well, clearly this is a sign. Now, Amy, I tell this story a lot, especially to younger actors that are like, teach me things, right? Which yeah. I totally respect and admire. I, it, you had to sit down at the audition and read the copy. Well, instead of sitting facing forward and just sitting in a chair, imagine I turn sideways and I put my feet up on the chair so I'm hugging my knees and like, so I'm hugging my knees and I have like my chin on my hands because at the time that is what every tampon commercial looked at, looked like. Like, look at me sitting so comfortably on this like white couch while I'm wearing tampons. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and so not only did I know the tone of voice, but I also knew what they looked like and I booked it. I booked it. I booked it. <laughs> I called my mom and I said, I'm the other girl. I'm the other girl. It's me to pick me. And then once you book one, you just like the floodgates are open. You just booked a ton of, and I booked a ton of the world. Yeah. Which is great. Oh man. That's but, so fun. I, oh, that's I so mean, sweet. Do you, don't, like do you happen you, to have the YouTube of that tampon commercial? Is that available? Uh, it's not on YouTube. Okay. It's somewhere. It's somewhere. Okay. Well, yeah, I have some other ones though. And then right after that, I booked... <laughs> I booked uh, I booked one for Nike. I booked Ooh. one for Nestle. I did I did one for Nestle, and they sent me to Spain to do a commercial in Spain. Oh, very and nice. And I wait for this. This is so long ago where you still had to pay long distance for oh. your phone, right? <laughs> so I go to Spain, and they tell me in Spain that my they're paying for my hotel room phone. So I called people. Because I could call them for free that I didn't call from New York City because I had to pay to call them long distance. <laughs> I was just like on the phone while I'm like calling people. <laughs> They're like, oh it's two in the morning. What are you doing? I'm You're like, like, I oh. Know, but, oh my God, I called my like, college ex boyfriend. You know? oh <laughs> like, I'm in Spain, oh God, so jerk. Funny. Oh my God, I love it. I love it. Man, hey, they had to say that. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. So tell me about the physical comedy <laughs> because you you mentioned that you know you want this monkey role, and I'm like, what? How does yeah. this? Tell me more yeah. about this. Are you taking like clowning courses, like, or is it just part of the <laughs> improv that like led okay. you into physical comedy? And do you do more of that now? Okay. All right. Here we go. <laughs> I will send you a video of this. Huh? In the summer of, over college, I had a friend. The clowning, kids' birthday parties, the whole thing. It's in Buffalo. Balloon animals, magic, all of it. He <laughs> says to me, Tracy, um, I'm working this party, and they want a mime for this party. Um, do you want to do it? Well, I am in theater school, so of course, yes. I will put white <laughs> face on and dance around like a mime. Of course I will. So I had, when I was a kid, we had gone to SeaWorld all the time because my uncle worked at the one in Cleveland and he was a horticulturist. He was all the plants and they had this mime named John who would like entertain people when you went to sit in the Shamu show. And this guy fascinated me. So I would sit and watch him while people went on rides. I would just sit and watch this like mime guy, but he didn't do like, ooh, ooh, I'm in a box. He was like really interactive clowning stuff, which is very like Bill Irwin style. If you know, Bill Irwin. Yeah. And so anyway, Josh was like, come be a mime with me. I was like, okay. So I went to his house. I used his crown white. We put makeup on together. And I went to this like gig. 
And I didn't like have any traditional mind experience. I was just like weird and silly and whatever. So I was like, I'm just going to play with the kids. And I like pretended to toss a ball to them and they would toss it back. And I, I just, I did really interactive pretending play things just to mime and I didn't talk. Right. And the guy who had hired my friend, Jeff was like, where did you come from? And you were amazing. (laughs) And I was like, I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. So he started hiring me to do all these gigs. So I was like, right. So I would just like, okay, but I'm never probably going to do them in a box. That's not, I don't want to pretend I'm in a box. So I just started to develop on my own. this kind of like very interactive kind of thing that I didn't awesome. realize afterwards. I was like, oh, this is what other people are already doing. I just didn't know what it was called and that this is what Bill Irwin does or this is, you know. And so what happened was this same friend, Jeff, uh, in Buffalo, there are the Buffalo Bisons, which is a triple-A baseball team. And it seats about 25,000 at their stadium. It's pretty big for Buffalo because Buffalo doesn't have a major league baseball team and they, it's a sports town. And so they're very big into the Buffalo Bison. Mm-hmm. And so he said, Hey, they're hiring people to do like pre-show, like run around the field and stuff and just do stuff with kids. You should come audition with me. So I missed the audition. I forget why he gets hired to do this. I call up the Buffalo Bison and I said, Hey, I missed that audition, but I really want to do this thing that you guys are asking people for. So why don't I just come Sunday and just work? but you don't have to pay me and just let that be my audition. And if you like what I do, then you can keep me. And if not, then don't. And so they were like, you want to come work for free? Okay. <laughs> so I was like, this is a bad I idea. Decided. Don't take, this is bad advice, kids. Just don't do yeah, this. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> no, this is great advice. This is 100% great advice. All right. Because <laughs> my entire career, which we could talk about for days about all the different weird things and some things I've done, <laughs> but. I like to call myself like a crack dealer of my own and en- my own skill set and energy and entertainment. I will give you a little taste of me for free and then I'm going to make you pay <laughs> <laughs> like that. But the truth is that has served me incredibly well. Right. As, and I'll get that and I'll, and I'll continue that. But let me just say that like, as my career has progressed, and I have been hired for different things. When people say, hey, we want to hire you to live event host this big, huge event for 10,000 people, we have $100. You know, I'll be like, oh, uh, no. And I, would, I will always say, great, that is not the rate that I work at, but I really want to do this job. I want to meet you. I want to meet these people. I will do this one job for you right now, but know that if you want me back, this is the rate that I work at. And then I do the one job for less money. And then I do that job for the next six years at the rate that I want. Yeah. You know, so, you so that has out. been my sort of business MO since the beginning, since I didn't even know what I was doing at all. Mm. Um, but so, yeah, so then I, so I get hired by the Buffalo Bison to, and I create this character called Loudmouth. But instead of just dancing around on Sundays before the game, this is where it gets fun. I see Buster Bison (laughs) and Buster Bison is the head mascot. And I'm like, I want to be Buster Bison's sidekick. So I start kind of putting myself into more and more positions at the stadium where more people see me, where whatever I start aligning. I, I take a picture of him with his jersey and I like make a vision board for myself. But then I didn't really, I was still like sort of developing this character. It didn't really have a costume yet. It didn't really. And so the Bison said to me, Hey, we love what, so like maybe a month in the Bison say, we love what you're doing. This is so fun. We're going to do this thing for the taste of Buffalo, which is a big Buffalo um, festival. And they said, we want you to go with the Bisons and go with, with Buster Bison. And I said, super cool but how will they know I'm from the Bison? I think you guys should give me a jersey that says Loudmouth on it and has a star on the back so that you'll know I'm from the Bison. <laughs> <laughs> so they did. So they made me a jersey, you know? And it's like, it's funny because I did so many things without thinking and with no pressure just because it was fun and easy that now as a more seasoned actor and more into entertainment industry and whatever, I have to remember sometimes that it is that free and easy if you allow it to be. Mm. Like, I decide that things got hard. I decide that the doors are closed. I decide. I'm like, no, it isn't. Just say, like, I would like a jersey with a star on the back and, like, 
continue to show up and do the work and then people will see it, you know? Um, (laughs) So within my career, I have done, so Amy, on my website and on my business cards, it says, I do lots of fun and creative stuff, right? That's what it says. I do lots of fun and creative stuff because I, for a while, I think I started limiting myself by being afraid to be more things than in quotes, just an actor. Well, but if I do more photography, you're not going to think I'm an actor anymore. Or if I do more of this, or if I do more of that, instead of seeing all of these disciplines inform each other and make me actually better at acting. When I do photography, I become a better actor. An actor gives me um, better vision to communicate with people to be a better photographer. And that helps, you know, they all, all the, things help each other but I think that we limit ourselves and we get in our own way by saying well I can only be good at one thing or what if someone doesn't think I'm this anymore or what if someone doesn't think I'm that was it you though or was it somebody like in the industry telling you that you had to be one thing because I've definitely heard that I've definitely heard Mm -hmm. that in a professional way where it's like you got to be you got to be focused if you're not focused then you you know people aren't going to look at you I've definitely 100% heard that. So it's yeah, and, great and I that you're think, saying don't. <laughs> yeah, and I'm saying don't. And I'm saying that the we see you as one thing. What is interesting is I think, I think it's limiting and I think we limit ourselves because what if you say I am an actor, what does that mean? Do you say you're an actor? Do you say you're a storyteller? Do you say you're an artist? Do you say, like, why are you an actor? And then why are you this silly character loudmouth? Why are you all these different weird things? And then I realized, well, A, it brings me joy, and it brings me joy to bring other people joy and to use my energy in a way that affects people is exciting to me. And how that manifests itself, I, I don't care anymore if someone says, oh, well, you wrote a book. You're an actor. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a storyteller. I'm an artist. And so read the book or don't. And do my thing or don't. And yes, in some ways, I will say yes as far as if you want to be one thing and you want to fast track maybe in quotes, fast track, though I don't think there's a thing. Yeah. Like maybe in the older days you'd say, I'm going to go to the UCB and I'm going to go eat, breathe, everything. I'm going to only do scratch. I'm going to only do this. I'm going to show up to all this. That is absolutely a way. That is a way. Um, but I have found for myself that I have this varied career that is really exciting to me. And, and there have been times where I thought, Oh, if only I stayed with one thing or if only I did, or if only. but now as like a, I can now call myself like a full grown up person. I can look back and say, look at the magical joy of all the different things I have done. And now I feel like that sort of like rising tide raises all boats that all the Mm -hmm. things have made me better and better and better as an artist. And every time I visit all the different things, um, I'm better. And so what's interesting now, and clearly we can all tell your audience, uh, though I am excitable like this all the time, I am also living alone in the middle of a pandemic in New York City. (laughs) The, The opportunities I have to speak with joy about my job and my life are very limited right now. Right now. So thank yeah. you, and I appreciate this. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but, absolutely. I mean, you know, uh, so my next question it has to do with how you've navigated that. Are you yes. sort of moving through from job to job as they've appeared and just sort of like letting the journey lead you? Or, you know, how did you – decide to do anything you know what what's the next project that you choose to do how does the muse move you it's a great question um it's a little bit of both it's like i always it's one of these have a plan but be flexible to change the plan Mm. it's kind of like improv like right my life is one big yes and it's like i'm heading (laughs) in a direction i think the scene is going this way and then somebody throws it in another direction you're like okay i guess we're going in this direction and then yep. you go full force in that direction. You go, oh, this is okay. But at the end, you've made this like really powerful scene. But you didn't really exactly know where it was going to go. But you have to be available. And you have to move forward with power and be available for change at the same time. Right? When you're doing a really good improv scene. And so I have done a little bit of both. And part of that is, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? When you're living in New York City and you're like, oh, how should I 
pay my bills so that I can eat. Um, right. So some of the things have come up, though, and this is what I would say to other creatives listening. It's, it really is about yes anding in the biggest possible way. It is about looking for opportunities and then yes anding them. Or I like to say no or. Is it no or? It's something. If somebody gives you a no, can you pivot it, right? If you really wanted something, you wanted to be a part of some theater company because you want to meet the people, but you didn't get in as an actor, can you say, what if I did this for you? Right. What if I really want to be in your show? Clearly, you know, I want to be an actor, but I'd love to meet you and be a part of your company. Could I uh, assist in stage manage you on a show so that I could get to meet you? So maybe I can be in the next show. Oh, like, totally. what is worth it to you? Right. Totally. Like, how do you how, you still what do you want to be a part of? Yeah. And so I, I have been very um, crafty throughout my life with this like way I was raised, like take a stick and make up a game. Right. I've been very crafty. So I was temping for a friend of mine um, at an experiential marketing company. And I mean, I was doing like, I called, there was a thing called the Great Safety Adventure. It was a kid's thing. I had to call. I had to say, do you want the safety house to come to your school? Right? That was my job. But there's a lot of things happening at this event agency. And so one of the things they had was something called the Wheelmobile. And it is the Wheel of Fortune stage show to get contestants for Wheel of Fortune, like the actual Wheel of Fortune. Oh. And so they, they said, oh, the woman who plays Vanna for the road um, is sick. Do you want to go play Vanna in Little Rock, Arkansas this weekend? And I was like, uh, uh, sh- sh- of course, of course. But then again, you're getting to know me already. I would say, um, that's fine, but you can't pay me like a temp. You have to pay me like I'm an actor because this is not a temp job. That's my skill set. That's what I do, right? Yes. So I get them to pay me more. So I go to Little Rock, Arkansas. Now, I didn't have a chance to sort of be fully trained on their stage show, but I know Real Fortune. I mean, I grew up watching Real Fortune. Yeah. So because it was a stage show and because I'm like half mascot, half improviser, sketch comedian, plus dramatic actor, all the things, I was like, well, this is the stage show of Real Fortune. So clearly the Vanna is not just standing there like a television Vanna who I respect, but it's, you know, she doesn't get to do a lot on the television show. Right. I mean, this is a stage show. So like, I was kind of like getting a little bit crazy and cheering. And I was like part just mascot Vanna, I guess you could say part. I just like went for it. Cause whatever, I'm there in little rock for the weekend. I'm never coming back. Like just have some fun. Well, the people loved it. The people from LA loved it. And they said, um, we would love it if you would consider being Savannah and, and you know, it's like 20 cities a year, 20, 20 cities a year. Oh my God. And you bumped that I, girl hardcore. Well, she lost no, her gig. I, no, she didn't. <laughs> I didn't. I said, I love that you love what I do and that I brought something weird and different to the table that you didn't think of as the stage version. I approached it as a stage version and I said, but, you know, at this point, I started doing a lot of independent films and stuff and playing good roles. And there's none of those films you can find anywhere, by the way. So, um, But I said, <laughs> I, I don't, I love this job and it's super fun, but it's not really a career move for me. You know, I said, it's exciting, sure. you know, the prospect of traveling, though, and all these different things. So I said, what if, what if instead of being your um coming on the road for these 20, well, what if I'm your permanent backup Vanna? And every time the Vanna can't do it, like I'll do it. And then I'll cast and train all your new Vannas, um, you know, to do it the way oh. I did it. I'll, I'll, I'll find. So here's why I stop for a minute, because this is what I always like to say. And I was like, what is the thing I like to say? Why can't I remember? It's this. <laughs> There's generally an answer between yes and no. So there's yes and, and then there's also a find the maybe, find the what if that's between yes and no. What if I offered you this instead? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I said, no, you want me to do the tour. I don't want to commit to the tour, but what if we did this? Now, here's the thing. I Then I worked for Mobile for 10 years. For 10 years, I did it. And I cast and train all the vanas. I do a handful of cities a year. Each year, they would say to me, hey, we have a, a do you want to go to to Austin? Yes, I do. You know, when I would go to wherever the cities were, and then if I wouldn't do it. And so 
It was a fantastic opportunity, but here's the point, dear listeners. The point is, I made that up. They said, do you want to do it? I didn't want to do it, but I still wanted to do something. So I made up a new opportunity that lasted me for 10 years. That's crazy. Because I just said, what if we did this? So yeah. here's another thing, is that that's, that's sort of what I've been doing my whole career. And so I had this, so I, I started doing, you're asking like, what's the muse, right? So oh, yeah. I so I started doing photography. I grew up, my dad had dark room in the basement. I grew up with it, but I never pursued it. And then when things went digital, I was like, I want a digital camera and I want to learn photography. Um, because I was eating, sleeping, breathing, pooping, acting, reading plays on the toilet, on the subway, like whatever. And I started getting uh, less work and more boring. Because I think I was having less life experiences and more just inside the work in the the in the in a mm. way that like actually became unhelpful after a while, mm. right? Because there was no human life in me. It was just like, oh, I got to do this. Oh, I got to do this. Oh, I got you know. And it just got it just like I had had some successes, and then I couldn't like tip it. And so uh, I said, the only way that I'm going to be a more interesting actor is if I'm a more interesting human and I need to do other things outside of acting. And this is when I was like, I need to explore more photography. I need to do other artistic things that bring me joy. So I started doing photography and um, I thought I booked a movie that was shooting in Australia. The movie fell through. My subletters left me bed bugs. Because I had left because I thought I was going to Australia to shoot a movie. I went to stay with my husband, my boyfriend at the time, until I went to Australia. But I didn't go. I come back with no money, no movie, no job. Because I said no to them all because I was going to Australia for three months. The subletters left me bed bugs. I didn't have any money. I didn't uh, have any jobs. And I had to throw away my couch and my chair because they had bed bugs in them. Yeah. Not just my bed. Right. So I had no living room furniture and no money and some debt. And I was like, okay, fantastic. So I can't control when I'm going to book another commercial. Right. That's out of my hands. I can't control when I'm going to do more sketches on Letterman or when I'm like, there are things that are, that are out of my hands. You can't control those things. I was like, well, I am a photographer. I'm getting better at it. I can start doing headshots, I can control that to a certain degree, right? Like what are jobs I can do? Because I was like, waitressing isn't going to get me enough money fast enough that I need for right now. I was yeah. like, it wasn't, a, I was not in a good place. So instead of buying a couch and chair that I couldn't afford or charging furniture, I charged photo equipment and turned my living room into a studio. <laughs> and every Friday, my friend Carrie came over and I bought her lunch and we did photo shoot Friday. And I took thousands and thousands of pictures of Carrie, learning different techniques, learning different styles, learning how to shoot headshots, learning, because I already knew I was good with people, right? But I just needed to up my technical skills. And because I'd always like done a bunch of print and commercial print and modeling stuff, like I knew the other side of the camera super well. So I was like, okay. So because I was doing photography, the same people, the same event company that had hired me for to do Vanna on the road knew that I was doing photography started hiring me to shoot events for them. Right? So I start yeah, shooting events for gig. them. That's a good great money. To great be with this money. Company. Uh this company my, is is responsible. I can trace everything back to this basically. Wow, that's so and great. So it's amazing. So then what happened was uh um I was like, oh there's another whole other chapter I'm leaving out, but that's okay. This isn't my whole life story. But <laughs> but so so what happened was though <laughs> um, then he says to me, my friend Jim that I'm talking about says, Hey, we just got this. Um, this is fall of 09. He said, Hey, we just got this contract with Virgin mobile. Who's going to be sponsoring lady Gaga's tour. Um, and we're going to do some, like, we're going to do this like event before the show to take pictures of the little monsters. Like maybe you could do like DC, New York and Boston or something, the close ones, Philly, whatever. Cause we're going to hire a local photographer in every market. And, and now keep in mind, this is the fall of 09 to Lady Gaga was like just, it was still, it was still like a, a theater tour. It wasn't arenas yet or anything. It was still, you know, early. Mm. And um, it was the very first big tour. 
And so uh, I said to Jim, I said, well, I said, you're going to hire a different photographer in every tour. I said, this is Lady Gaga. I barely knew who she was really by this point. I'm like, this is Lady Gaga. You need to make this a performance art event. I am a photographer and an actor, and you need to hire me and put me on the road for all the cities. Nice. Right? Now, meanwhile, I was barely a photographer that was, I mean, I was good, but like, I mean, I was really like stretching my skill set here. So Do it. he said, so he said, well, um, we don't have the money to put somebody on the road. And then I countered with, well, but don't you need to put somebody on the road that is, don't you have someone from the office that has to go to all the cities to take care of the brand ambassadors and the local staff and whatever? I said, I'll do it. I'll do <laughs> both. I said, I'll Hello. take their hotel. I'll take whatever. I'll do it. Then the next thing you know, like I'm on a tour bus touring with Lady Gaga and that lasted on and off for five years. <laughs> right? I mean, I got, listen. Talk got about stories. a pivot. I got stories. Pivot, pivot. Yeah. That's the question. Man. Here's the question. Did touring with Lady Gaga make me a better actor? You're damn right it did. Because I learned more about myself as an artist, my point of view, people, what I care about, witnessing other people, being on tour with Lady Gaga, watching her blow up from the inside. That is invaluable. To be on that tour as it grew and to watch her each night in concert as she grew as an artist, invaluable. Did you learn most from her or from the, like, people around her? Both. Yeah. But I learned a lot from her. Because here's the thing. It's really interesting. So even being on tour, you know, like, I was in my 30s, right? And, but no one, even though my parents are supportive and my family's supportive in their way and all this kind of stuff, nobody had ever said to me, you can do this. You can be whoever you want. You can do whatever you want. Be it. Do it. Go for it. Right? No one ever said that to me. And if you know the love language, it's like, I need words. Like, words are really important to me, I've learned. that. Like, I, I respond to words. And so I'm standing in the, arena, or in the theater for the first time where Lady Gaga mid-concert says, I'm here to tell you. You know, everyone told me I couldn't do it, and I wasn't pretty enough, and I wasn't skinny enough, and I played piano well enough, blah, blah. and I'm here to tell you that you can do whatever the fuck you want, and you're a goddamn superstar, or whatever. And I bawled like a small child. I wept my face off. And I was like, wow, like, yes, yes, wow, holy cow. And everyone in that arena needed to hear it, and those theaters needed to hear it. Like, we yeah. need someone to say to us, like, you can do it. Like you can be it, you know? Yeah. And, and it, it was so, I mean, I, I, I obviously like, I learned a lot from all of the work ethic and all the little monsters and everybody. I, I learned, I, I mean, forever I could talk about that, but it, but it was, um, it was really important and exciting work. And I came back, and I came back and I published a book with the little monsters. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was just, it was a magical, magical time that changed my point of view as an artist and as a human. And it made me start calling myself an artist, not an actor, not a filmmaker, not a photographer, but an artist, big picture artist that I do lots of fun and creative stuff that I have like a world of work that is super exciting and engaging to me. And yes, do like, I would like to be a series regular on a show that is network or Netflix or yes, I, I still, uh, I think the beauty of this career is that it, it, I, it I'm not an athlete that's going to age out, you know? Um, sure. People can say like, Oh, you're too old for this. Or, mm, I don't, I don't really buy into any of that. I don't. Um, and I sometimes in my dark moments, I might, right. I might be like, Oh, it hasn't happened yet. I'm like, but what hasn't happened yet? No, it's all happened. Every day I feel like joy and success. And so here's the important part that we're going to tie this together with is me alone in a pandemic in New York City, right? <laughs> so here we are. But it's really actually, but here's the, here's the thing. It's really critical, I think, in my life right now. Because what am I doing alone in a pandemic? You know what I'm doing? I'm creating art. I'm making sketches. I'm doing sketch comedy. I'm making videos. Because I am happiest when I'm creating. And just because I lost a ton of jobs and gigs and shoots, that someone was going to pay me for, like, I don't, 
yes, you want to make a lot of money. Yes, it's super fun. But like I create art because I like to tell stories and I like to share and I like to work through my emotions by telling stories and doing sketches and being funny and weird. And that's the core of who I am. And so when I'm alone in a pandemic, I have found my core really is to sit here by myself and to like tell stories and make sketches and do things that are resonating with little bits of people at a time. And people are saying like, Oh my God, thank you for this. And it, it's okay that it's not a billion people because it's, I'm doing it because that's how I express myself as a human. And that if I sit here in a pandemic alone and do nothing, I am not joyful. When I dance around in my apartment alone with wigs, (laughs) you know, I feel a lot of joy (laughs) and I'm doing things now in the sketches that I'm making in the little short videos. I would not be doing if there was not a pandemic. I'll be on to the next job and the next job and hoping somebody else hired me for this. And I've got other things in the, you know, that I'm working on or whatever, but there is this, I said this to a friend the other day, this sounds super weird because some of my days are terrifying and it's New York city and whatever and pandemic. But also I feel like I'm in this kind of like, magical portal you know would you say you're in a magical portal yeah to my best self i'd say i'm in a magical portal to my best self Mm. if i want that if i want to take that i could sit here and not do that right but also i've been given this gift of time and opportunity i'm alone with nothing but time and a green screen (laughs) so what am i going to do with that and who am i who am i i'm a creator so wake up and create something And if people like it, great. If they don't, great, cool, whatever. But just get up and do it. And that is where success comes. And that is what people resonate with is when you're doing it because you want to. Yes, you want people to see it. Yes, you want to share. That's what artists do. We share our feelings. But I feel excited about, so weird, this excitement I feel. um, In a way, I know, this is so weird, but I know at the end of this, there will be benefit for me as an artist because I know how I operate. I know how I yes and. I know how I, what's the difference between yes and no and where's the opportunity in it. And my whole MO as an artist and as a person my whole life has been trying to carve out opportunities where they didn't exist because I needed to. Because I needed the next job. I needed the next thing. I needed to pay my bills. So it's like now I sit here alone and I'm like, what is, what's the opportunity in this? Yeah, I mean, you're doing such a great job. I feel like it's like you're just sort of like dealing with it so well by letting it be a creative outlet for you. It's wonderful. And I think, thank you. I think it's the only way I really know how. Like I made a sketch a couple weeks ago that was called Pandemic Squares, right? And it's like, and it's like, just like Hollywood Squares, I challenged myself to play nine people play a character, play, and it's, and there was a recurring character already from another game show sketch I made earlier, like a pandemic PSA. And at the end of it, at the end of Pandemic Squares, uh, the main lead, the main contestant is a teacher who's alone on Google Classroom. She's doing Google Classroom from a bathroom. And she just goes, I'm just doing my best, I'm doing my best. You know, and the whole sketch is about, like, if you're doing your best, you're winning right? The sketch is a game show, but there's the, the winning is the prize. There's actually no other competitor. She's not playing against anyone but herself, you know? And if you're, (laughs) and if you're getting through the day, you're winning. And you know, that sketch is for myself, you know, it's like a sketch to tell me to remind myself, like you're doing your best, like you're doing your best, (laughs) you know? Yeah, you are doing so, your best. I mean, it's all that you can do, and you seem to have been founding, finding a way to, you know, tap into that, not let the lows be too low or let the lows further, uh, you know, inspire you to, to create something else. Well, I think the lows I've learned, I've learned, and, and I don't know, and maybe you feel this way also, we talked about this a little bit earlier, um, before we were uh, officially online about mm-hmm. how, you know, when you do a show and then the show is over and there's this, all, this magic and then the magic kind of ends and whatever. I know through my whole life, like when a show ends, I'm sad. Right. And then there's a steep low. I'm never going to do anything mm-hmm. cool again. I'm never going to, you know, and then, you know, then you get back to reality and then you have another thing. And 
So I, I have gotten more comfortable with the ebb and flow and I've been able to sit a little bit more on the day that I call it my 2% time. They're like 2% time. I'm just dark and I just go there and I am sad. 90% of the time I'm okay. But what's important is for me, when I get to my 2% time, I have to allow myself to feel it. Yeah. And I have to cry and I have to unpack my baggage and like go through all the baggage and then like put it away. If I try to ignore it, it doesn't work. So in pandemic time, it's maybe not 2%. Maybe now it's 10%. Maybe 10% of the time I'm like, this is not going so good. But I have to say, you're in the middle of a pandemic. If you want to sleep all day, have at it. Be good. That's totally good. You yeah. can do it. You know, and trying to like, because then I know if I allow the deep emotion, then it's like, then tomorrow I wake up with a new day wanting to create something, wanting to express those feelings differently or wanting to, but like, I have to allow the dark. If I don't allow it to happen, then I, then I kind of like average out the light, if that makes sense. And I can't get to the good stuff. I can't get to the high stuff. If I, if I don't acknowledge the dark, then it sort of seeps in and makes everything gray. Yeah. Yeah, I feel that but way too as far it. as like, you know, when it feels bad or when things aren't going well, I just try, and I mean this in a large sense, not even pandemic yeah, yeah, times, but like, you yeah. know, you're you're writing, you're performing, things are going well, and then all of a sudden like your show's over, you finished writing that thing, you don't have another project yeah. yet. You're in this weird limbo time. Earlier you had mentioned yeah. like the need to go out and experience the world and do that. And I think <laughs> that it is interesting right now that there's this ebb and flow of like creativity coming out of a time when like we can't really interact with each other as much. I mean, like stuff like this is mm -hmm. great. I liked being able to do yeah. this because like this is real yeah, this is a real conversation. Sure. Like yeah, that we're having with like a human person, <laughs> but like yes. at the same time, like I, even in the regular, you know, honestly, this is, you know, this is in the two hundredths of, of episodes. I've talked to a lot of people. Sometimes people don't give themselves the time to talk, to like have yeah. a conversation, to like connect with another human being. And I think that yeah. you were saying earlier, like you need to give yourself time to like live your life and then the other time is creative like because it needs mm -hmm. to balance out the people who are mm -hmm. like not being creative right now that's because you're soaking up the world culture's happening all around you this is history and you're soaking it into your little bones and then it's going to come out right. creatively in whatever way that it's going to come yep. out later but right now it's yep. like you know incubating and like becoming something in the way sure. that so many for of sure. our ideas like percolate in our brains for years mm -hmm. you know this mm -hmm. kind of stuff will come out like i'm already starting because like i'm the kind of person who like when like a big um when a big thing happens in the world uh i watch for the cultural like uh, backlash of it or different ramifications. Yeah. So, like, so like after nine 11, as an example, there were, that's when all right. of the superhero, like hero movies started coming out. Like there weren't right. those right. until then because we needed a hero then. Right. So then all of a yeah. sudden, all of our movies were about that. And it's like, mm, I wonder, and I've been like trying to think like, what is what's happening right now to us globally going to lead us right. into in movies? Like, what are horror movies going to be about? Isolation? Probably not. Probably not. But, <laughs> like, yeah. other things, you know, like, how that affects. Like, I can't wait in, like, 10 years for the documentaries. Like, this crazy thing mm -hmm. happened. You know, you're like, what? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just, you never know. You never know what is going on. So, anyway... You're great. I'm really thankful that you have like chatted me up about like not only like <laughs> not only like your journey, but like just even just talking just now about like how to create and like keep it up and like just be an artist like fully, you know, accepting yeah. all the different parts. That's really uh, it's been really great. And thank you so much for, you know, being on the podcast and sharing the stories with me. Oh, my gosh. Well, I appreciate getting to talk to you and this has been exciting and I promised you would be a little tangential because you know pandemic time but I am I am very <laughs> grateful to talk and um and um you know and and I'm gonna go now I'm gonna I'm finishing filming a little um little bit that I'm doing that is a video that is about trying to find balance it's legitimately about trying it's a silent film that I keep like losing my balance 
It's like a <laughs> film about trying to find balance, like <laughs> figuratively, literally. Like, I love it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Yeah. Finding balance. Oh my goodness. That video will probably be out by the time this, uh, this, uh, Episode I'm hoping comes it comes out tomorrow, so. so it better be out. It, be, it better be out by the time it comes out. Yeah, I'll make a note to make sure that everyone listening to this can uh, can see that video. But uh, thank you so awesome. much, Tracy, for being awesome. on the podcast thank and sharing you, your stories so much. and great advice. Thank you. Keep up the great work. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's wonderful to talk to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for listening to Yes But Why podcast. Check out all our episodes on yesbutwhypodcast.com or check out all the content on our network, HC Universal, at hcuniversalnetwork.com.